Welcome to the Five Stone Buildings webinar program. We have just opened the live link, so we're just going to wait for a few minutes to allow everybody to join before we start. But whilst we are waiting for everybody to join, I shall just remind you of the house rules. Just to remind you that this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions during this webinar, please put your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And our speaker will try to come to them at the end if we have time. If you do not wish to be identified when asking your question, then please tick the anonymous box so that our speaker does not identify you in their response. And just to remind you that we now have a webinar section on the Five Stone Buildings web, uh, website page where you will be able to find a copy of this recording and the slides used and any previous recordings of webinars take, that have taken place. I will now hand over to Matthew Roper. Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome to um, the latest Chambers uh, webinar. Uh, today, as the title suggests, I'm going to be giving you a short uh, update on trusts. Um, and I have selected and will briefly summarise and discuss some recent decisions concerning trusts and in particular the exercise of trustees' powers, uh, which I consider to be interesting. Obviously, hopefully, hopefully you'll appreciate that there is a limit to the number of cases and depth of analysis possible in 30 minutes. So I apologise if I haven't covered a particular case uh, that you're interested in. Uh, and also, you'll probably all be aware of the Privy Council case this week uh, in the Glenella and Rezed Trust litigation. And it may be that in due course, there's uh, a webinar to be done on that. Um, so um, turning to the first decision, um, uh, that I want to mention uh, is actually not all that recent, uh, having been decided by Chief Master Marsh in July 2019. Uh, this is PQ and RS. Uh, however, I think it's received rather less attention than it deserves, and I propose to do my bit to alter this. Uh, now, in that case, there was doubt as to whether illegitimate children, and in particular a child who was reported as V, uh, who was born shortly before her parents married, uh, were included within the class of beneficiaries as defined therein. Uh, so you'll see as set out on the this, this slide, the background, uh, the, discretionary, the discretionary settlement was made for the benefit of the settlers' children and remoter issue in 1968, uh, so before the rules um, as to legitimacy changed. Uh, the fund was held under the terms of a deed of appointment. Uh, at the time of the hearing, this was the kind of governing deed uh, from 1987, uh, which provided for the settlers' grandchildren, RS and TU, to have life interests and, and subject there to for it to be held for the children of those grandchildren. Um, the trustees had an overriding power of appointment in the terms uh, set out on the slide, uh, which importantly included the words for the benefit of the beneficiaries, um, but they didn't have a wide power of advancement uh, available. Uh, Joe, if you could just turn to the next slide. The, uh, it's important to note, because obviously it's an issue of construction in terms of who comes within the uh, class of beneficiaries, that the 1987 appointment did not define the term children of the grandchildren or contain any provisions concerning the illegitimate, uh, concerning illegitimate or adopted children. RS, one of the uh, two live tenants, was married and had three children at the date of the hearing namely V, who I said was the um, one uh, born shortly before the parents married, W and X, uh, TU was unmarried and had no children. Uh, now, as you may be aware, according to the common law rules of construction, a child is legitimate only if the child uh, was born or conceived in wedlock. So uh, V was not uh, a legitimate child and within the meaning of child uh, for these purposes. You may also be aware, obviously, the decision of Mrs. Justice Rose, as she then was, in Rehan's will trusts, which suggests that um, that is to be read down effectively uh, by European human rights legislation. Um, but so as to avoid uh, this very difficult question about Rehan's will trusts, um, which is controversial to say the least, um, uh, the trustees uh, simply asked the court if they could exercise the, their power of appointment so as to include the illegitimate, legitimated and adopted children 
uh, if there were any of those late, latter classes uh, in future within the class of beneficiaries. Uh, and Joe, if I could just ask you to turn to the next slide, just, just kind of pausing there, it is worth noting, although of course they're over to, and he expressly says that he's expressing no view on the point, it is worth noting that Chief Master Mars noted the uh, doubt about rehand um, and whether it would be followed in future. But anyway, on that basis, he, he said that there was enough doubt to really proceed on the basis the trustees were asking him to, uh, which was to decide whether the power of appointment was wide enough uh, to make an appointment uh, onto trust where the illegitimate children were definitely included. Um, so uh, in that regard, as many of you will be aware, um, powers of advancement, uh, advancement that is not powers of appointment can can be used to create new powers notwithstanding the rule against delegation and they can also be used to benefit non-objects where that's thought to be for the benefit of the object itself himself or herself um, powers of appointment uh, have however traditionally been treated differently and there's no as they were very different powers certainly in the way they used to be drafted and there's no shortage of authority to that effect um, uh, to the effect that subject to contrary construction of the power of appointment, the donee thereof may not create new discretions. Now, the best view is probably um, that a, a power of appointment, which includes the words for the benefit of the beneficiaries or the word benefit generally, uh, enables the creation of new discretions. Um, and, but that issue has largely uh, been overtaken by modern drafting practice in any event. Um, However, despite uh, the similarly common view that it's permissible to exercise a power of appointment expressed to be for the benefit of a class of objects, for the benefit of non-objects, in the same way as you would with a power of advancement, um, there was no positive authority to that end uh, for private client practitioners to rely on. Um, moreover, Joe, if you could just turn to the next slide. Joe, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, moreover, the leading practitioner textbooks um, are far from clear on the point. Uh, you'll see that the extract there from Lewin on trusts rather boldly states um, that such an appointment would be invalid. Um, and then, Joe, if you could turn to the next slide. Uh, Thomas on powers, after quite a long uh, discussion about the fact that there is no authority for this and the, the difficulty in this area concludes that there probably shouldn't be uh, a difference between the two, at least where the, the word benefit is used. So there's considerable uncertainty. And if you're faced with um, quite a large fund, as in this case, um, you're basically left with having to go to court to get directions. Um, so the chief master's decision in this case, as he did decide, uh, that, that the power of appointment, including the word benefit, was exercisable for the benefit of non-objects, is a welcome addition um, to everybody's uh, armory, certainly non-contentious uh, advisors. So, Joe, if you could turn to the next slide. Um, that said, it is necessary to urge some caution because the chief master's judgment was almost exclusively focused on the uh, permissibility of delegation, which, as I've said, um, has kind of uh, gone with modern drafting practice, and I would have thought it gone with the drafting practice uh, employed in this trust. Uh, and he seem, seems to have really simply assumed that the power of appointment could be exercised uh, to benefit non-objects. Uh, uh, you'll see he's referring really to the width of the power to create new trusts. So that's really about delegation, as I say, and creating new discretions uh, before going on to say the language used allows the trustees to revoke the existing trust to create new ones, providing that that is for the benefit of RS and TU is permitted under the power. I'm satisfied the trustees have power to make the appointments and nothing else is really said about this very difficult question about benefiting non-objects. It, it, it seems to have been, simply been assumed that that was the case. Uh, nevertheless, that is authority that you could rely on in future if you have a case um, where the power has the same wording. Uh, that said, if you are uh, faced with the kind of large fund where you might have gone for directions in the past, it may be that you still want to seek directions in future because of the uh, slightly unclear nature of this authority. Uh, and it might be that you're able to get a clearer authority for practitioners going forward. Okay, Joe, if we could turn to the next slide, please. The next decision I want to briefly look at 
is the judgment handed down by the Royal Court uh, in Jersey uh, last month and reported as in the matter of the May Trust um, as set out in the title to the slide. So you'll see a set out on the slide the background to the matter. It was a kind of standard offshore discretionary trust uh, governed by Jersey law. Um, it was actually established by a deed of appointment out of a head trust, which was governed by the law of the Cayman Islands, but they changed the governing law. By the time the application came to be heard, the class of beneficiaries consisted of someone who was referred to throughout the judgment. I think this will be relevant when we come to talk about the points to take from it as the principal beneficiary, even though he wasn't defined as such. And I, I believe he was the son of the set law of the head settlement. His wife, um, their children uh, and grandchildren an issue and also a UK charitable foundation, which was run by the principal beneficiary. Uh, his wife and an independent trustee uh, and that was we'll see was kind of the the focus of this trust or at least this sub trust uh, the trustees had wide powers of appointment and advancement exercisable for the beneficiary's benefit so unlike the uh, last decision this was a case where there wasn't the difficulty of benefiting non-objects if that actually came up because there was a power of advancement which made that relatively clear okay joe if we could just turn to the next slide um as i said the trust had a, a history of charitable donations and indeed uh, to date it's had given it sums in excess of eight million pounds to charity whereas it had only given about a hundred thousand pounds to the family itself um and it was now proposed and this is the reason for the application to distribute 75 million pounds which is about half of this fund to the principal beneficiary for him to transfer it to the uk foundation that they were running um now that's although obviously it's a large sum of money so you might expect an application is so far so normal um the, the 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 difference here is that although the trustees could have distributed this amount directly to the foundation without incurring any uk tax liability the principal beneficiary wanted them to distribute it to him so that he could give it to the foundation and by way of making certain declarations for gift aid etc um, give about 25 percent of it to the uk tax man on the basis that he thought that was a social good or the family as a i say the family as a whole as i say on the slide then the adult beneficiaries as a whole thought that that was a, a good thing to do um and 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 the reason that that's um, the, the, the reason the, the, the question that really comes up or comes out of this um, decision, I think it's relatively uncontroversial that the word benefit is to be given a wide uh, construction, both in Jersey and in England. I think it's also relatively uncontroversial, albeit very unusual, that you can have benefit by way of provision for uh, the tax man although um as i say it's going to be very unlikely that it comes up but you know that can be a moral benefit it seems to me that you can uh you can discharge on behalf of the beneficiary for their benefit the real difficulty was the uh, jurisprudence in england uh from a case called x and a uh, a decision of mr justice hart uh, which hadn't, which hasn't changed at all in England, which kind of restricts the extent to which you can uh, satisfy a beneficiary's obligations uh, by reference to whether they would actually be able to satisfy that obligation themselves, um, i.e. whether you're actually helping them out. So if, if the beneficiary couldn't give money of a cert of, of x million pounds to a charity or to, to to the revenue or whatever it may be then obviously you're not actually relieving that beneficiary of of the burden of doing so so joe if you could just turn to the next slide um that's the relevant or one of the relevant passages from the judgment of mr justice hart which is as i say just says that um uh, it's a requirement that, the, that there be some sense in which the beneficiary's material, material situation can be said to have improved. Um, uh, uh, the thing in this case, if we can turn to the next slide, Joe. Uh, Joe, if we could turn to the next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so in this case, um, at least in Jersey, the law has now moved on from X and A. Um, the court deciding that X and A is not an authority which Jersey court should follow. Um, they did so on the basis, one, that X and A was uh, 
much influenced by the particular facts of that case. Um, and also uh, having regard particularly to the flexibility of uh, what, what, what may be called the trust industry in Jersey. And then there's reference basically to the last 40 years of uh, trust drafting practice and, and really the use of offshore trusts as vehicles for international wealth. Um, and reference was indeed made to the fact that the principal beneficiary had been referred to as such throughout, even though there was no definition even of him as such in the trust. Um, and effectively therefore reached the conclusion um, that there's no need uh, to limit uh, the way in which benefit of a moral uh, satisfaction of a moral obligation uh, can be achieved by way of a power of advancement or a power of appointment in Jersey. So Joe, if you could just turn to the next slide. Joe, if you could just turn to the next slide. Um, no, no, the one before that, please. Thank you. Um, so effectively, it was down to the trustees to see if um, there was a moral obligation which could be satisfied, and it didn't matter that the trustee couldn't, uh, the beneficiary couldn't have satisfied that obligation out of their own funds. Um, and it's also um, the case in, in this decision that the trust included a provision enabling the court to completely disregard the interests of the minor beneficiaries or any other beneficiaries. So they were able to proceed basically on the basis that the adult beneficiaries all wanted this to happen. Uh, and so it was approved. Um, the um, important, it, it is important, I think, though, to emphasize the difference between trusts in the two jurisdictions. Uh, not only did the judgment in the May Trust express the uh, base departure on the flexible nature of Jersey trusts, um, the, uh, the, the judgment itself uses terms uh, which are somewhat alien for a traditional English trust lawyer uh, to the effect that the uh, discretionary objects and some more than others had, had really proprietary interests in the funds. So I think it is important just to emphasize the, the, the different approach to trusts and the fact that this decision is really based on the flexible nature um, of an offshore trust as a, as a kind of product, as I say, as a repository for international wealth. Um, so it's possibly uh, unlikely that the English courts will follow uh, this decision. Nevertheless, of course, it's open for uh, someone now to argue uh, that really uh, times have changed uh, and uh, the court's approach to uh, benefit under a power of advancement should do so. But as I say, I think it's, it, it may be unlikely because you, you're unlikely to get a situation where the uh, where the terms of the trust are identical and the uh, requirements the same. Okay, Joe, if we could turn to the next slide. And the final case I want to uh, discuss or go through is uh, the decision in Womble, Bond, Dickinson and Glenn um, uh, uh, earlier this year. And that was a separate webinar actually by my uh, joint head of chambers, Penelope Reed QC, on this point specifically. So if you want to drill down into even more detail, uh, you could probably uh, get that online. Um, but I do want to just briefly touch upon some of the points made. So uh, as the background set out on the slides, the, um, the set law created a settlement in 1992 under which five funds were held for the benefit of children remote issue. Um, clause nine uh, provided uh, for a remaining fund of which the beneficiary is defined as the settler's present uh, and future grandchildren um, and provided for that to, uh, to be held for one or more of the beneficiaries of the age of 25. Uh, but this was subject to clause 10, which had a proviso in it. Um, uh, and, and in short, uh, what, what the proviso uh, produced uh, is quite bunched on the final, final bullet point of this slide. Um, is you'll see in bold at the end the words for the beneficiary absolutely um, was a was an absolute gift um, within grafted trusts uh, so a Hancock and Watson type issue um, and because of time I am actually going to uh, skip through the issue of Hancock and Watson 
uh, and how it was found to apply in this case. But uh, to cut a long story short, Master Clark, who heard this matter, uh, found that the, the rule in Hancock and Watson applied um, and she rejected a submission that the rule in Hancock and Watson could only be engaged if the engrafted trust had already failed. Uh, and this was because it must, as a rule of construction, that's obviously what it is, a rule of construction, be concerned with the set's intention when creating the settlement and not be something which just kicks in at a later date. Uh, and Master Clark referred to the decision of the House of Lords and Attorney General and Lloyd, Lloyd's Bank Limited in support of that proposition. Um, on, on the facts of this particular case and the construction of this particular instrument, as I say, Master Clark found that the rule applied. Um, and finally, Master Clark rejected the submission that the rule did not apply because of the ultimate gift to the grandchildren. Um, that is a factor which can mean that the rule in Hancock and Watson does not apply. Uh, but she found that really in this case, it was a belt and braces provision, um, or as the trustees council put it, uh, that this had been included uh, just act so as to acknowledge the, the, the rule in Hancock and Watson's uh, applicability. So Joe, if we could just actually uh, go a few slides on, I'll tell you how to stop. Keep going. One more, I think. Yeah, if we could stop there, thank you. Um, one issue that was left after the Hancock and Watson um, point was decided was, um, a slightly less dry issue of construction, which was uh, whether the proviso in section 32 um, applied. So there's an absolute gift with engrafted trust, which may take, uh, which, which may come into effect if the person with the absolute interest has any children. At the time of this, um, at the time of this uh, hearing, the people who were interested as the absolute beneficiaries uh, had not had any children, um, so those engrafted trusts had not come into effect yet. And the question was whether um, the potential uh, future children, the unborns, um, had prior life interest for the purpose of section 32, uh, and that section 32 is unamended by the 2014 Act. Um, now, the first point, obviously, was whether the grandchildren, uh, the absolute beneficiaries, um, had uh, interests which in, in, engaged Section 32 in the first place. And there was no authority on that, uh, really, whatsoever. But nevertheless, she held that the uh, rule in Hancock and Watson gave the grandchildren interest in capital for the purpose of Section uh, subsection one of section 32, which is on the slides, um, and at least until the event of defeasance occurred. And I think that's pretty uncontroversial. The more difficult question, as I say, was whether the interests of the unborns had prior life or other interests, using the words of the statute, to those of the grandchildren. Um, and of course, the potential for unborn beneficiaries to have such interests is in fact implicitly contemplated in section 32 one C, uh, of uh, the Act is set out on the slides. So Joe, if we could just turn to the next slide. Um, Master Clark actually held that the interests of the unborns could not be construed as being prior to those of the grandchildren. Uh, and you'll see that in, as set out on the slides, uh, she held that in my judgment, prior refers to the order in which the trust property is enjoyed. Um, a life interest being enjoyed before the interest in remained it follows in my judgment that the consent of persons with interest subsequent to the capital beneficiary is not required. The trustees are not, of course, entitled to disregard the interests of those persons. Um, and therefore she found that there was no need for the court to, um, which it had been asked to do in the alternative, to intervene and provide, uh, and provide uh, consent on behalf of the unborn beneficiaries. So this is um, a useful, albeit quite difficult to quite difficult and dry decision to some extent, uh, which clarifies the nature and application of the rule in Hancock and Watson uh, in more detail than I've uh, been able to go through today, because it would have taken more than the kind of five or so minutes that we have left. Um, uh, of course, whether 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 such consent, um, whether 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 the consent under Section Thirty Two um, 
is required will be a matter of consideration in the circumstances of each case. But as we can see from the judgment, it does appear that consent will not be required before the beneficiaries taking under the engrafted trust have come into existence. And that's really the important point in this case, is that the unborns were just that, unborn. So the engrafted trust had not yet come into existence. Now, as I said, there was um, in the alternative uh, a request for uh, the uh, court to give consent so far as uh, that was necessary. Um, and unfortunately, the court wasn't required to go on to consider whether it needed to dispense with this consent, because that would have been an interesting point or a useful uh, bit of jurisprudence for everybody. Um, and that was understood that uh, counsel for the trustees had intended to rely on the fact that the court can dispense with consent to exercise a power of sale. Uh, and the over to uh, comment of Mr. Justice Morton in Re Forster's settlement, a case in 1942, to the effect that he may have considered exercising the jurisdiction under Section 57 of the Trustee Act 1925 to dispense with the requirement for a beneficiary who was uh, uncontactable because of war to consent to funds being raised out of capital. Um, however, in, in, in my respectful view, I think it's unlikely that these authorities would have assisted given the dispositive rather than administrative nature of the statutory uh, power of advancement as opposed to uh, Section 57 and powers of sale. Um, that concludes uh, the three cases I wanted uh, to go through uh, slightly earlier than uh, the whole 30 minutes that we had available to us. So I don't know if anybody has any questions uh, and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, if not, um, of course, uh, feel free to contact me at some point um, uh, and we can discuss it in future. Uh, it doesn't look as if we have any questions. So um, on that note, I'm gonna say, uh, Good afternoon to everyone and uh, I hope to see some of you sooner rather than later uh, in person even. Okay, bye.